Do you want to know little tips about buying an older home? And by older, I mean really old, 100 years old, maybe even 200. It's not crazy. This is New England, and we're talking about the Boston area. So stick with me, and I'm going to give you some background tips to learn about before you start house hunting. And then when you get to the point where you want to buy something and you have an inspector, you'll feel familiar with what is important and what you're going to look at. So stick with me. I'll be right back. We're going to talk about old homes. You're probably a fan of history, architecture, and old homes in general. Well, New England has a ton. And if you're looking in the Boston area and some of the outlying suburbs, there's lots to look at. Old homes can be gorgeous if they're kept up. And if they're not, you have to be willing to do a little bit of work. If you're looking for an older home and not these big, open, modern things, I understand you completely. I grew up in a home that was built in 1870. It could be a little older, we're not quite sure. Almost any town in New England is going to have homes from the 1700s, 1800s for sale. Early 1900s are really not that old, but there's not much of a shift between like the 1880s and 1920. So some are well maintained and some unfortunately are not. The first order of business is using a good inspector, well versed in old homes. Um, the first thing to look at is the basement. Any water. Most have a dehumidifier running with a small hose connected to a outgoing water pipe or a sink. It works great. It costs about $50. Plumbers generally put them in, but you, you don't have to hire a plumber for this. Um, probably you can do it yourself or have a handy person do it. The other water-related issue is a sump pump. It depends on the history of the house. If it's in a generally dry area, you will not need it. You won't see it either. But basically, a square hole in the basement floor with a pipe draining out and a pump that automatically turns on and off when there's water seepage, usually from a high water table or a massive rainstorm. It's, it's generally something that just happens off and on during the year. And it has to drain out of the building away from the house. It's usually covered with a big portable cover. You know, it could be a big piece of plywood or um, some kind of cover that would be heavy to lift. The third thing about a basement in an old home is the foundation. Very important, sometimes you'll see a dirt floor. The foundation's made of field stones in most of these homes built before, say, the 40s. Gathered stones from the countryside, build the walls below ground level. They do their job. It should be waterproofed at some point. If it looks really dry and fine, leave it alone. If there's a brick foundation in the basement, you may notice red dust on the floor. Brick will eventually crumble, and here's where knowing a good mason will pay off. They'll cement it, seal it, and waterproof so the wall is good as new. Just part of upkeep in an old home. Now you're also going to notice uh, the beams in the ceiling of the basement. They're usually wood, they're a deep rich color, and often look like they're petrified wood. Builders often took an entire tree and used it as a support column and beams in the house. The inspector will tell you the condition of the wood on the sills and generally the source of sagging floors. Usually it can be fixed, so do not despair. I'm always amazed at how solid old homes are when they've been maintained well over the years. The next thing is the electrical and the plumbing. It will be the most important things to review with an inspector. There's when There was no electricity when these homes were built. So it's very interesting to see how it was converted from gas with spigots on the wall to electricity. The first electric lights were developed in the late 1870s all over the world. I'm going to share some surprising facts about electricity and plumbing and how the United States converted. In 1882, Edison helped form the Edison Electric Illuminating Company of New York, which 
brought the electric light to parts of Manhattan. We're talking late 1800s, but progress was slow. Most Americans still lit their homes with a gas light and candles for another 50 years. Can you imagine? So only in 1925 did half of all homes in the U.S. have electric power. So I'm only talking 95 years or so. Make sure electricity in these homes have been updated to circuit breakers. You need that for insurance purposes. You might find a box downstairs that still has um, little holes in it that you would screw in um, a fuse, a glass fuse. Those are no longer, insurance companies will no longer insure your house because circuit breakers are much safer. 1840s, even though Edison didn't bring it to Manhattan electricity in 1880, in the 1840s, the art and practice of indoor plumbing took nearly a century to develop, starting in the 1840s to 1940. Nearly half of all the houses lacked hot piped water, a bathtub or shower, or a flush toilet. I know. <laughs> I was surprised. Over a third of houses didn't have a flush toilet. Working class houses where bathrooms were first built around 1900 and in the 1920s council houses were built in England those are uh, government subsidized housing. So council houses were built with bathrooms. In 1829, go back now, Tremont Hotel in Boston was the first hotel to have indoor plumbing. And it was eight water closets, so they were shared with guests. Isn't that interesting? We've come a long way, baby. Um, where did they put them? So, for instance, in the house I grew up in, it wasn't a fancy Victorian. It was a classic peaked roof, square um, building, hardwood floors, and... Where was there to put a bathroom? Well, on the second floor, from one end of the house to the other was a hallway. And what they did is they sliced that hallway, put a door, it was a wide hallway, and that's where the bathroom ended up. So they plumbed from the bottom up through the middle of the house, and same thing with electricity. It Still in the basement, there are some cut off gas lines with a little spigot, and there's a post, and you can see where you would have turned the spigot to put the gas on and lit the flame for light. Isn't that amazing? So that's why in some Victorian homes, you'll see an unusually small bathroom, water closet with just a sink and a little um, toilet. And, or unusually big. It's a huge room. The toilet's here. You walk over there to the bathtub. You walk over there to the sink because they converted a full bedroom to a bathroom. So the last thing I'm going to bring up about very old houses that you want to keep uh, top of mind is lead paint. You may see, um, I don't know, on all the seller's disclosures because generally if it wasn't tested, they don't know. But anything built before 1978 when the law became uh, enforced where you cannot use lead paint in any new construction or can't use it at all in any residential neighborhood, uh, home, in any residential home, um, before that there was lead in paint. Peeling paint is a hazard for children under six years old. What happens is a few chips fall, they're playing, they put it in their mouth, it tastes sweet. And so they eat it and you don't see them eat it and it will give them brain damage. We have to stay away from lead paint with children. Interesting thing is, um, I knew people who had a home, they've had it for years, and in the 70s when this law came out, they literally heated up and scraped all the paint on all the woodwork in their house to the wood. So when you think about it, there's no more lead paint, so they don't have to worry about it. But the bottom line is the lead seeps into the wood. Now, I don't know if it would leach out or not, but everything was painted with latex after that. So chances of chipping, also latex over the, the old paint, uh, tends to be stretchy and not chip as much. 
But the bottom line is if you're going to rent a property, you want to have it deleted because then it's not an issue. And the mediation that you can have done, you can either rip off all the wood or anything below three feet gets treated with a milky kind of paint that seals it so that it's called uh, an abatement and it will seal in the lead so that when you paint over it there's no problem with it leaching out and you'll get a certificate and then you won't have to worry as a landlord to rent or for your own children but it can be quite expensive and just want to let you know um, a lot of, you will always sign a lead paint disclosure when you buy a house because it's such an important thing for people with children. I hope this helped you. Um, oh, the best thing I can tell you is use a good inspector. By that I mean not just someone experienced, but someone who understands you're a buyer and you don't need any drama, just the facts. When you have an inspector that will give you a rundown on everything and you walk through with him or her, um, they can give you an idea. This is an issue you need to fix right away. This is an issue you don't need to fix it for two or three years. This might cost you about $1,000. This might cost you seven or $8,000. They can give you a lot of facts and information so you can make a plan and you can still buy your old house and just make sure you space out your repairs over the next few years. I hope this helped you and please feel free to comment and subscribe on my channel, Boston and the Burbs. It's a great place to live and I can help you find a great place or I can help you sell your house and move to another great place. Have a great day.